This is the Intermax and PDMAX user group call for February 28th. This is Carol Crone from the Society of Thoracic Surgeons and on the line with me uh, from Kirkland Solutions, we have Patricia Potter, Brandon Singletary, Devin Cole, John Pennington, and Maceo Pleget. And from the STS side, we have Emily Conrad and Lee Ann Jones. So I'm gonna hand it over to Patricia. Uh, Patricia, just give me the go ahead for the next slide. Please okay. be sure to put your um, questions into the Q&A and we'll get to those as soon as the presentations are over. Okay, thank you, Carol. Appreciate it. Hey, everybody, it's Patricia with Kirkland Solutions. Um, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, we've already introduced our teams. We can move to the next slide, Carol. All right, so on today's webinar, I'm going to go over just a few STS updates. I have um, a few updates that were made to PDMAX, so I'll be going over those today. And then on the line, we also have Brandon Singletary today with Kirkland Solutions. He's going to just um, take a few minutes and go over some edits, enhancements that will be coming to our dashboard in the next com coming months. Um, and then also today we have Devin Cole on the line with Kirkland Solutions. She is going to be going over form downloads, live data downloads. Um, and then at the end of the call, as usual, we'll go, we'll go through any Q&A you all have. Um, just go ahead and put those questions in the Q&A function and we'll answer all the questions we can. And if I can't answer your question, um, I will give you my email address and you can email me and I will get back to you with that answer. So that's today's agenda. We can go to the next slide, Carol. Um, so like I said, we have a few PDMAX updates. These updates went live this morning. Um, so I just wanna go over them for those of you that are on the call today that are, that are our PDMAX data managers. So on the um, lab and anti-thrombotic forms for the PTT, the anti-10A assay and the and fibrinogen, we are adding two new answer options. Um, so I know some of you have had a hard time with some of our parameters that were set, either they were um, too low or too high. So we've added in the drop down on those um, lab questions, there's an answer option now for below the lowest parameter, and also an answer option of above the highest parameter. So if your value doesn't fit what our parameters are set to, um, we now have those options on those forms. And then um, for the anti-10A assay on the anti-thrombotic form, we have added, um, this is an option under unfractionated heparin. I think that we only had an option for a PTT in the past, and I know um, some are monitoring with the anti-10A. So that is now an option and you can put your um, levels in there. And then for functional, compact, functional capacity on the pre-implant, follow-up and implant discharge form, we have added an answer option of not applicable to the ambulating status question. So it asks under fun functional capacity if the patient is ambulating, and we did have yes, no, and unknown. And then for those patients that it's not applicable for, it's not developmentally age appropriate, we've added um, an answer option of not applicable. And then I have a couple more updates. Carol, if you move to the next slide. Um, for transfer, we've made a couple of um, edits to the trans, not the process, but just some helper text. Um, you'll now receive, so when you're receiving a patient, you will receive an automated email for the patient transfer and the patient um, Intermax ID. So you'll get an automated email that says patient ID number has transferred to your center and they will now appear on your active patient list. Um, so you'll now have that Intermax ID. So that'll be nice. So when you get an email saying a patient has transferred, you'll now know who it is because the Intermax ID will be um, included in that email. And then um, we've just added some helper text to the transfer form. We added, um, please ensure all follow-up forms and adverse event forms are completed before submitting the transfer. Um, so just making sure that everything on your end for transferring the patient is tied up, all follow-up forms, um, any AEs that need to be entered, um, make sure those are all completed before transferring. Because once they transfer, you probably won't be able to go back and the receiving center won't be able to um, complete that documentation if the date is after those form dates. And then 
um, the transfer date should be the last date you had contact with the patient. So that could be an admission date or a discharge date from an admission, um, clinic visit, a telehealth visit, um, just the last time you had contact with that patient. I think sometimes people are, um, they will enter like today's date, like I'll ask them to enter a transfer form and they'll put that date, but that's not really the date they last had contact. So sometimes that can um, mess up the transfer process. So just a few little helper text things that will help hopefully help make transfer um, a little bit more smooth. All right, Carol, next slide. And then um, the 2023 quarter four reports are scheduled to be distributed um, March 31st. So just at the end of next month and the data entry deadline for those reports was January 31st. So be on the lookout, the reports will be coming at the end of March. Next slide. And then 2020, 2024 AQO uh, data managers meeting is gonna be coming up in September. It's gonna be in person in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, so that's really great, really exciting. We hope to see lots of you there. It's a great place to network. Um, put some faces to some names, um, really great presentations, lots of great content in the past. So I really hope some of you all can make it there. Um, we will be beginning the planning committee for 2024 AQO. If anybody would like to be involved in that and have some ideas around um, presentations or topics they would like to see, at AQO, reach out to me and um, we can certainly get you on that planning committee. So if you are interested in that and you know you have some ideas of what you'd like to see at AQO, we would love to have you. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me. Next slide, Carol. All right, so Brandon, um, I'm gonna just turn it over to you for just a couple minutes if you wanna give any um, dashboard updates or enhancements that may be coming our way in the future. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Patricia. Um, greetings to everyone on the call. Uh, hope you're all doing well. Um, excited to um, let you all know that <clears throat> there are going to be, or we are going to continue to expand our dashboard and reporting tools to you all. Um, I hope um, you all have had the chance to see our dashboard um, or for the designated users at your center that you are able to access and utilize this dashboard. Um, for your center. Um, if you cannot, or if you have any questions in general, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and also, I am happy to do one-on-one kind of -on -one demonstrations, um, kind of work through the dashboard and the Kaplan Meyer tool with anybody who is interested in, in gaining more knowledge on these tools that you have available to you. Um, so um, one of the things that uh, that I'm excited to offer, um, it seems simple enough, but I'm uh, hoping to add the ability to directly link you from the dashboard to our Kaplan Meyer or our time to event tool um, within the web-based data entry. That way you don't have to leave, look for the next tab. Um, it'll just take you straight there if you're wanting to look at more long-term outcomes than what the dashboard provides. Um, additionally, coming uh, at the end of this quarter, we're looking to add a couple of new filters to the dashboard, um, with those being pre-implant EGFR, as well as a filter. Um, we've got several, received several requests, requests for this, a primary VAD filter. So um, looking at patients with no prior history of durable LVAD or being able to filter to patients with prior durable LVAD before their first NMX device. And then lastly, we are looking to add another adverse event exhibit to the tool, um, looking at right heart failure, um, being able to look at all right heart failure as well as individual groups of early, acute, and late right heart failure. Um, so look for those coming to you. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free, free to reach out to uh, myself or Patricia and I'm happy to assist you with any of these task time to adventures. Right. Thank you so much, Brandon. I know everyone will be excited to be able to drill down a little bit more on right heart failure. So that'll be a really nice enhancement. Um, next, um, Devin, we're going to um, talk about form downloads, live data downloads. So we're going to turn it over to Devin now. Okay. Thanks, Devin. 
Hi guys, I am so excited to share with you guys today. So let me share my screen. So I'm gonna reuse some slides that I've used in a previous talk. So maybe you're familiar with this talk that I gave at AQO. Um, I've given this talk, I think, three years in a row now. So I really enjoy teaching people about the form download. So I'm just going to kind of start with these slides and then go into like a live demonstration because I want to show like how do you even access the form download. So this is a screenshot as if I was logged into the web-based data entry system and you can see I've selected this hospital X. This is just a hospital that we've generated here at the DCC where we can like have test data. So I've selected hospital X and then I'm going to go to this reports tab. So if I click that, you'd see this, all these different things that we have, the data quality report, QA, and then the live data download. And the thing that I really like to draw attention to is that the live data download is available to all all users, that's right, not just site administrators, all users, so anybody at your hospital right now could go in and download any of these forms. And so let's say that we clicked on this live data download, we'd see like all the list of forms. And so I'm going to step, you know, jump ahead a few steps. And let's just assume that you went in there and you downloaded these exact forms that I have on my desktop today. Demographics, implant, neurological dysfunction, pre-implant, and re-hospitalization. Now, why would you want to download those forms? Because that's the examples I'm giving today, guys. <laughs> All right, so um, what I'm going to do is kind of go one by one and show you some really cool examples today. We're going to start really small, and then we're going to work up to some bigger examples that I really enjoy giving. Okay, so first, let's kind of talk about what the form download is. So think of all the data that you've put in to Intermax. You can get all of that data out in an Excel spreadsheet. And I'm talking one spreadsheet per form, every variable that you have entered into the system. And the really cool thing about the form download is that it's all instantaneous. Let's say you downloaded a form and you saw this value of creatinine and it said 16. And you were like, oh gosh, that's, a, that's an outlier. There's no way that that's 16. It's actually... 1.3 and you went in there and you changed it to 1.3 if you re-downloaded the form it would be instantaneously updated so that's another way that you can kind of play with the forms too it can serve as like a data quality check maybe you can go through and look at some of the values but what we're going to do is we're going to start with demographics form and we're going to kind of look at the structure so we always have these top three rows it's going to tell you okay this is the form download this is the demographics form it's telling you that it's containing all pending, incomplete, or validated demographics forms. And it's telling us that this is hospital X. So all these X's that you see here, everything's been de-identified. Um, I give this like the Devon Cole de-identified data guarantee. That was a lot of words, but every single thing I de-identified. So everything's been, you know, we're going to mess around with all of this. So all of this is just kind of test data. All right, so the first thing that I want to do is I want to talk about filtering because while it's so easy and you're probably like, oh, I can filter in Excel, filtering is really helpful. So we're going to go here and we're going to click sort and filter and filter, and it's going to make these little drop down arrows. And let's say that we wanted some listing at our, at our hospital and we only wanted females. All right, well, there we go. We have all females. And let's say that we only wanted let's say, um, marital status, uh, married, why not? Okay, so I mean, those are, of course, those are super simple. But like I said, guys, we are going to start small and keep building. Okay, so now we've talked about filtering, but let's talk about a way that we can kind of summarize data, create charts, and create counts. Well, that's what we use pivot tables for. And let me show you how to do that. So we want to highlight the area that we want to turn into a pivot table. So here, we're going to go to insert and pivot table. It's going to say, hey, this is the data range that you want the pivot table. Yep, that's what we want. And now we can see all these different columns that are in this data set. And again, we're just in the demographics form. And the one that I wanted to do is called patient life status. And patient life status, let me pull this here. I'm going to pull it as a row. So that's telling the table, OK, make this a row. And now I'm saying, I want to see the values of patient life status. And so what this is telling us, and everything that I've created has 100 records. So this is what we expect. It's saying that 10 of the patients are alive, 44 dead, and 46 transplanted. OK, so that's just one 
quick little thing that we could do with the demographics form, but I'm going to keep going with different forms. So I just wanted to use a small example in the demographics form, but now we're going to go to a bigger form, one that has a lot of information in it that I really like to work with, the pre-implant form. All right. And so again, let's kind of look around here. And again, I've scrambled all the dates. I've, you know, put X's in the first and last name. So everything's been scrambled, de-identified. And what I'm going to do here, again, we can see at the top here, it's the form download. Um, it's telling us the hospital. It's telling us that it's pre-implant. And um, it's telling us that this is all pending, incomplete, and validated forms. Okay, so now what I'm going to do for my example is I'm going to mess around with this implant date. So I'm going to insert a new column here. I'm going to call this implant, if I can spell it right, implant year. Okay, I'm going to use this nifty function called year. I'm going to extract the year from the implant date. I'm going to drag this all the way down. And with just something as easy as that, we've extracted the year from this implant date. And I'm going to use that to create a few things, okay? So I'm going to click here. And again, just like I showed you, highlight the area that we want to make a pivot table. Insert. We're going to go to pivot table, okay? And this is telling us all of the different columns that are in our data. So we want to mess with this implant year. So I'm going to move it to this thing that says columns because it's going to put it across the top here in the columns. Now, now it's asking me, okay, well, what do you want the rows to be? Well, I'm really interested in device strategy. And this is also really cool. You can kind of search for the columns. Let's say you don't know the name and you're like, oh, I, I think it's called device strategy. There you go, device strategy. It found it for you. Okay, so rows. And then what I want to see is all of the counts of different device strategies across the years. So this way you could look like within your hospital, what does, you know, how many, what, what device strategies were happening from, you know, 2006 to the last implant date that we have, which is in 2015 at this, you know, in this particular data that I made. And then what I wanted to do is, let's see here. Yep. And so we have this. And now what I want to do is add another layer to this. Okay. So now I'm going to move this thing that says device type. I'm going to move it to the filter option. And now what does this do? Well, first off, this is showing us all devices, but let's say I wanted to just limit it to LVAD and say, what is the LVAD device strategy across time? Well, you could do that. And of course there's BIVAD. It looks like we have a, uh, TAH in here. Okay. So that's just another way that, that we can kind of mess around with the data. All right. Now I'm going to move to the implant form. I'm going to kind of do one example on each of the forms so you guys can kind of see the full scope of what we can do here. Okay. So now I am going to move to the implant form. All right, again, all the data here, implant form, again, just telling you what this is and telling you that it's Hospital X. Again, all the dates, I've, I've scrambled them. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna, again, insert a filter here. Oh, nope, I don't wanna do that. I wanna filter it. Okay, uh, and then I'm going to scroll. And let's say that I wanted to only select let me see if I can find that column. Where are you? There we go. Um, the ones that have ASD closure. So this concomitant surgery, ASD closure. So we wanted to click this and we wanted to say, I only want patients at my hospital where they had a concomitant surgery and, and it was AS, ASD closure. Okay, well, we can see that there's two patients that meet that criteria. Well, let's kind of go to the next one here. All right, let's say cabbage. Okay, so we have one patient with that. All right, so this is just kind of showing you guys, you can just do some really easy counts, some, you know, just some quick data quality checks. All right, and so now what I'm gonna do, oh, I wanted to do one more thing. Because this column, you know, I like to mess around with device brand. And so first I just kind of wanted to show, okay, let's only limit to HeartMate 2. And then within HeartMate 2, we can like do a filter within a filter. And then we can do, HeartMate to LVADs, okay? So that's just another way that we could select those patients. So let me kind of put everybody back together here. And we are going to do device brand by year. All right, so again, let's mess with this implant date. 
And again, we need our implant year. And we're going to hit, well, yeah, year here. OK, and we are going to drag this down. Awesome, awesome, awesome. OK, so now we've pulled the implant year. And now what I'm going to do is kind of similar to what you guys just saw. I'm going to insert a pivot table. All righty. And then what I'm going to do is I want my rows to be implant year. And then can you take a guess at what I want the counts to be? Device brand. All right. So let me do device brand, device brand. OK, so here we go. So this is showing us like across the different, you know, or we can see like all the different counts of the different device brands across time. And so now let me swap this up and kind of make it look different because there's different ways that you can display these charts. You can have it this way or let's say we want it this way. Implant. Yep, yep, yep. OK, and now this can be serving as a filter. We've changed the filter to be device brand because right now it's showing us all of them. But let's say we wanted just HeartMate 2, just Syncardia TAH. OK, so there's a lot of different things that we can do here. All right, so now let me go here. All right, I'm going to swap this up just a little bit. And then, no, I think I like this better like this. OK. I am going to see if it'll make us a little fancy chart. OK, awesome. That's that's exactly what I wanted, guys. So what I was hoping was that I could just insert chart. And that's exactly what you can do from pivot tables, is that once you have a little table of all the data, it's so simple to just turn this into something a bit more visually appealing. And I'm I like, you know, I'm all about the visuals, guys. I mean, when I see pretty colors, I'm like, ooh, I want to look at that. So now we have this nice chart. And we can see all the different counts across the different implant years. And I mean, here, if you wanted to select one, you can. But this could be something that we could add some nice labels to. You know, we could add the data labels so we can see the different counts. We can and then print this off and have a really nice chart of what are the different device brands that are happening per year at our hospital. OK. Now I'm going to go to neurological dysfunction. OK, great. All right, so now this is one of the AE forms. This is the neurological dysfunction form. This is going to be one column per field that's in the neurological dysfunction form. We can kind of scroll through and see neurotype, you know, if they if they select if it's ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke, all these different subtypes. And I know that they, you know, had the new stroke uh, questions added in, I think, version 6 that came out. So. What I wanted to do was kind of mess with that, was create a little table of the stroke type. So that's exactly what I'm going to do here. OK, so I'm going to, again, select all of our data. I'm going to go to pivot table again. And then what I'm going to do is find this variable called neurotype. OK, so I want to make that. I want to make that in the row, put this here. And then I want to do a count of neurotype. And so this is what I expect. I made 100 records in all of the data. So just for like a self check, so make sure everything added up. OK, I see 100. That's awesome. And so what this is telling me is that 70 of the neurological dysfunctions are avert CNS injury. And you can see within type 1, like what they selected. So 30 had an ischemic stroke. 25 had this uh, hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, not specified stroke. Uh, let's see, this says symptomatic hypoxic ischemic injury. And then there were just some that said unknown. And then that there were 30 that selected type 3. So I think that's just a really cool thing that we can do with the data, especially with the interest in stroke, is kind of looking at what is the landscape of the different types within our data. So that's something really neat that we could do with the neurological dysfunction form. OK. I have one last example to show you guys. 
It's my favorite form to work off of. I don't even really know why. I think I just really like calculating length of stay and doing things with length of stay. But the uh, rehospitalization form, because we get a lot of interest in length of stay and, you know, looking at the different distributions and length of stay. So this is a really cool way that you could just do that, just right at the tip of your fingertips, going in right now and downloading the form. And so what I'm going to do first is, I would just like I said, just kind of want to explore a little bit. So I'm going to, again, just kind of filter our data here. And let's see here. Okay, so this primary rehospitalization reason, I'm going to mess with that first. Okay, so again, do some pivot tables here. Let me find it on here. There we go. Okay, so this is cool. So this is telling us of the 100 rehospitalizations. We can see like what the different reasons were. That 16 had a device malfunction, 12 were for major infection, 10 were for neurological dysfunction, and so on and so on. And so this is just a quick way that we could get some, you know, some some tabs on that. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to calculate length of stay. And if I need that, I'm going to need two components, right? I'm going to need an admission date and a discharge date. And as awesome as this is, I have both right at my fingertips right here. So that's what I'm going to do is make this cool column length of stay. And I'm going to say, OK, I want you to subtract this from this. And you're going to see, why did it do that? Well, it's saying, oh, I think this is supposed to be a date, but we're going to learn that we can format cells quickly, bam, turn this into a number, and there we go, 17. And we're going to drag this all the way down, okay? Bring it all the way down. And now we've calculated the days um, between the admission and the discharge date. And now what I want to do is just something quick, all right? So let's say... We wanted to see kind of like what the counts were for the different bins of, you know, the length of stay. Let's see. We Let's insert a chart here. Let me see. Doo -doo. There we go. That's what I wanted. I wanted a histogram. Okay. So what this is telling us is it's showing kind of like the distribution of the different lengths of stay. So this is the count right here. Let me add the data labels. You can kind of see what's going on with the data labels. So what this is telling you is that there are 65 patients that have a length of stay that's between 1 and 12. These little things on the bottom, um, I'm sure if you guys are familiar with histograms, across the bottom are like the little bins that show, okay, this was from 1 to 12, this is from 12 to 23, 23 to 34, and it's kind of giving you counts for how many patients fit into each of the bins. So it's saying, okay, 65 had a length of stay between 1 and 12, 22 between 12 and 23, and we can see that there's one patient way out here that had a really long length of stay. So it must be in the 90s. And so we're going to examine that. And so we've made our cool little chart. Maybe we want to kind of, you know, let's see, Devin's cool chart. And we could print this off and show it to somebody and be like, hey, this is the length of stay at our hospital. And this is a histogram of that. Okay. So now what I want to do is use length of stay and try to do some descriptive statistics on length of stay. All right. So I'm going to, I like to always work on a clean worksheet, you know, so I kind of just like to paste it and it's saying, Hey, I don't know what you're, what you're pasting here. So I'm going to do, let's see, SV, be sure to paste it as values because since I used a formula here to calculate this, if you try to like move a formula to another sheet, it's going to say, Hey, I don't, I don't know what values you're, you're pointing at here. So you just make sure to paste it as values. Okay. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate a few things. Let's say I wanted to know what's the minimum length of stay. Okay. So I'm going to use this min function and it's telling me, okay, you, we need to give me a range here. So I'm going to start in A2 and I happen to know that this goes to 101. Okay. So it's saying that the minimum length of stay is one day. So there's somebody that has one that had one day. All right, now let's look at the max. All right, so max. All right, and I'm going to say, give me the max from all these. All right, so there's that patient that we saw in that histogram, right? We saw that one patient that was all the way at the end that had, I think it was, you know, between 89 and, and 100. And so there we go. 
the 97. So there's somebody here that was in the hospital or, you know, had a length of stay of 97 days. All right, so now let's look at the, the mean, okay? And I think this is average. Yep, yep. Okay, and we're going to do A2 to A101. All right, so the mean value is about 14. All right, and so just using some simple, you know, easy Excel stuff, we were able to look at some different descriptive stats on length of stay and also make this really cool chart. And look, there's our one patient. And maybe we're like, hey, that's a long time for this patient. You know, maybe 97 isn't right. And that's another way that we can use all of these tools to really look inside of our data, do quality checks on our data, and ensure our data is the best that it can be, okay? So that's everything that I had for you guys. Um, feel free, let me see. Uh, I, I think that uh, Patricia wanted me to um, answer any questions. I'm happy to do that as well. Okay, so I'll uh, stop sharing now. Devin, thank you so much. I love the live data downloads. I feel like it is such a good resource. And like you said, you have all the information right at your fingertips. So there's a lot of really great things you can do and not have to wait for reports or um, it's all right there for you. So thank you, Devin. I think there are a couple of questions for you. Let me see. I'm just going to go through the questions that have been entered. And then if you need to sign up, sign off, that's fine. Um, there was one question regarding the dashboard, Brandon. The question was from Brian. Is there any plan to open the dashboard back up to more than one person? Um, I think I can answer that. As of right now, no, it's still um, just one person um, designated at each site. Um, what I've said in the past is, is if the person that has access to the dashboard is not the person that is using the dashboard the most, we can always um, reassign that role to somebody else at your center. But as of right now, it's just one person. Is that still the case, Brandon? Or are there discussions about um, allowing for more? Yes, so from the dashboard standpoint, it is currently still just one user per site. Um, however, that's not a definite forever answer. We are exploring future options. Uh, trying to look at our current licensing agreement and develop ways to allow more users to develop the dashboard specifically. However, when it comes to the Kaplan-Meier or the outcome analytics tool in the web-based data entry, that is available to everyone. Um, and that just provides another way that you can compare your site to the active. Um, and you can still do 90-day, 30-day outcomes as well as look at outcomes um, from an extended time period of follow-up as well. Okay, and then Devin, you have a question from Cindy. Devin, would you do a mini workshop on pivot tables at the AQO? Just wanting, just watching makes me so confused, but hands-on, that would better, that would stick better. Oh, I would love to do that. Um, so in Nashville, we can all meet up at Nashville, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, Cindy, thank you. Yes, that's a great idea. We can put that on the agenda and um, hopefully we can make that happen. Yeah. All right. And then another question from Bill. Is there any plans to make index reports with EPIC? There are other registries um, that with EPIC have helped created reports pulling information that you need altogether, such as the last webinar when it was asked to have some of the labs rearranged. It was if there was an Intermax lab index report, EPIC would put the labs in the same order as Intermax. So, Bill, I can just speak to the second part of it. Um, we do have a um, ticket to have um, the labs grouped better based on, um, you know, if it's a BMP or a CVC. So when you're pulling and entering, you're not having to skip around. So we are gonna do that piece of it. Um, Devin, do you know about index reports with EPIC? I am not familiar with that. I'm gonna say, as of right now, Bill, there are not plans to do that. Um, and then he had a second follow-up to that. On the same subject, our EPIC analyst here at Corewell Health is looking into creating something like this. If any other centers have 
like really good epic analysts like here, maybe they can all start creating these. I know Carrie plans on sharing her work in the epic library if she can get it to work. She is starting with the medications first. So yeah, if anybody else um, is working on something like this, um, Bill, I don't know if you're gonna put your contact information in, but you all are you know, welcome to work together. And then um, from Deborah, um, the speaker stated that anyone can access these spreadsheets in Intermax. When I try to look at reports or dashboard, I get a message that only one user can access the dashboard. And for the reports, I get an error message that reports are not oops, here to go, enabled. Thank you. Um, so that's correct for the dashboard, Deborah. You may not have, da have dashboard access at your site. If you're not sure who has it, you can reach out to me and I can tell you who does have it. And if um, that's not the correct person, we can make that adjustment. Um, but Devin, she should have yeah, access that's when odd. She I'm, on reports. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's odd to me. I'll have to look into that because I'm not sure why that would be happening. Maybe I can ask Rama. Yeah, and Deborah, if you want to send it to me, I can um, loop in Devin and Rama. If you even if you could send me a screenshot of what the error message is that you're receiving when you click on um, the report. Patricia, I'm happy to put your email in the chat box if yep. you want to. Tell me yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. All right. Does anybody else have questions for Devin? Also, wanna... somebody somebody asked for my, there was another question after that one that said, can we email Devin with any questions? I would love for you guys to email me. What's your, <laughs> and, what's your email, Devin? And my, uh, you, can, you want me to just type it like in the chat? Yeah, or... put it in okay. the chat box and okay. just make sure it goes to everyone. Okay. And I got to pull, I'll pull. There we go. Yep, there it is. Devin.coleacurso.net. Yep. Thank you yep. so much, Devin. Yeah, no problem. And I'm um, going to get Patricia's in there. Yep, and that's mine, patricia.potter.perso.net. Um, so I will answer these other questions, but I'm just going to quickly go through the rest of the slides and then the rest of the time we can use for Q&A. Thank you so much, Devin. If you need to sign off, I know you're real busy. Um, feel free to do so. You too, thanks, Brandon. Devin. Great job as always. All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> um, so a few important dates for Intermax and PDMAX. Our next Intermax um, PDMAX user group webinar will be on March 27th. So save the date. Um, March 31st, like I said, um, the 2023 quarter four reports will be distributed. Um, on April 18th, that will be our um, quarterly reports webinar that's hosted by um, Ryan Cantor and his reports team. Um, he covers all things reports, goes over um, some of the exhibits. If you have any questions about reading your report or anything report related, that's a really great webinar um, to join. And those are only hosted quarterly. Um, and then the following week on April 24th, we'll have our next Intermax PDMAX user group um, webinar. And then um, April 30th would be the deadline for um, data entry for quarter, quarter one, 2024 um, for that next report. So those are just some um, dates to keep in mind. And Carol, you can move to the next slide. Um, so I just wanted to put on here, sometimes um, people reach out to me and ask me how to join the webinars. So on the STS um, webpage under resources for data managers, I do have the link on there. Carol's going to show us. You can see um, upcoming webinars as well as the slides from previous webinars. Um, and there may even be a link to the YouTube channel to um, listen to previous webinars. So all that information is there. So, you know, today is February 28th. So that's today's webinar. Our next one will be March 27th and there are links um, to join the webinar. And then the final column is most recent webinars with um, the recordings as well as the slides. If we have any speakers, their slides will be there as well. Um, so that's great. And if you want to be notified of 
to be added on the STS list, there is a link, right? Add your name to the interest list. And then, Carol, correct me if I'm wrong, you get an email just letting you know that a webinar is coming up in a few days. Yeah, you should. Anybody who's listed as a contact for the site or a data contact as the site should be already receiving the reminder emails. They usually come out on Monday or Tuesdays uh, for the upcoming webinars. If you're not receiving it, just add your name to the list and you should start receiving them. And then under the View Past Webinars tab, um, so the way I got here was I went to the sts.org. When you land on sts.org, it will look like this. Research and data for data managers. And then um, you should probably add a tab here for the um, Kirkland Solutions website. This goes to the IQVIA website for our other databases. We should add a button here. I can talk to um, our marketing team who put this together to see if we could do that. Uh, anyway. Yeah, this the, is a good page to bookmark if you want to yeah. um, attend the webinars. Um, and and as you if you, webinars yeah, if you scroll over to the left, there's this table of contents here. And if you click on Intermax, it'll pull you all the way, uh, pull you to that section. And then this View Past Webinars will take you to the YouTube page where the past webinars are posted for Intermax. You can get back to the, S if you are um, abstracted for other registries, you can just go to the STS National Database YouTube uh, channel and uh, each of the databases are listed here on the, the uh, playlist. There's something else, Patricia, you wanted to give me a Another, uh, you want yes, I wanted to show them um, submitting FAQs okay. and um, if they need to reach out to STS for any question. Sure. Okay, so this is that same page Patricia said to bookmark. I agree, it's a very great page to bookmark. When you get here, it's the research and data for data managers page. This is where it will open to. The fourth, uh, fifth section here, clinical question request form, or it's also over here on the left-hand side, the clinical question request form. This is if you have an FAQ, a clinical FAQ that you'd ask, like to ask about um, the database, Intermax and PDMAX included. You would just go to submit a request. Mine looks a little different because I have an um, administrative view. So you won't see these three buttons, um, but what you will see is just basic instructions um, on how to submit an FAQ. Fill in your full name, your email address, and your phone number. Make sure your phone number is correct because sometimes um, we may need to call you uh, just to get more information or if for some reason your email didn't come across or it's getting bounced back. We can always reach out to you that way. Your participant ID or site ID number would go here. Um, database version, you would select Intermax or PDMAX, state or province you're in. Sequence numbers, I don't know that we have these in Intermax and PDMAX, but you could put in. Um, you could even just put in a title of the question or what the, you know, the. Yeah, yeah. you could just put the title of your question there and then. Put that's. It. Yeah, that's fine. And just um, make sure you don't add anything in like hyphens or periods. Um, no characters. Exclamation points. No characters, just numbers and letters only. Otherwise, it'll get rejected. So just letters and numbers only. And then short field name, you could leave blank for Intermax and PDMAX. And then just type in your question and tell them you're not a robot and then submit it. And this will go over to our FAQ mailbox, which is um, I'll be monitoring that uh, pretty much we look at that daily. So if you do have any questions, clinical questions, please reach out to use this format. It'll help us keep track of questions that come in. Um, we're able to download all the questions that come in in an Excel spreadsheet. So we can easily sort them out when we do upgrades or need to make changes or clarifications for training, uh, training documents or things like that. Um, makes it a, a great place for us to get that information uh, quickly to do that. Okay. And then Carol, there is a separate yeah. email, right? Like if they have questions about like 
just STS questions about like invoices or anything like that. I think there's a separate yeah. link for so non-clinical questions. If you have non-clinical questions, so contact and support the STS National Database Help Desk or the STS Database Staff Team. You could just use this contact help desk button and it'll get you over to uh, my colleagues. STSDB, put your name and your email address in your message and we'll get that message in our STSDB email that's monitored daily. Um, usually we stop monitoring that at uh, five o'clock central time. So just be aware we stop, mo we monitor usually from eight to five, I think it is. So. Um, but we respond pretty quickly. So we just ask that if you do have questions to submit them that way and we'll be able to um, be able to help you out as quickly as possible. And then I see something in here. My e Emily, the email for Monday in the calendar invite from that email said 2.30 Eastern time, 1.30 Central. Let me see what you're talking about there, Melissa, hold on. Oh, well, yeah, it would be 2.30 Central because we're on the webinar now. Yeah, the, it looks like the, I'm getting GTSD. Are you talking about GTSD? Yeah, you're talking about that. Yeah, the GTSD webinar that it starts at 3.30 Eastern today, it's okay. the time says 2.30, so I'm working on it. Okay. Oh, okay. Thanks, Leanne. So yep, the email was wrong. Okay. Yeah. That was yeah, for the general email harassment. The website is wrong. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. There you go. Leanne's working on it. We'll make sure everybody knows. Okay. I think that's what I had to share, right, Patricia? Yeah, I think that was it. Yeah, that was all. Okay. All right. Let me go back to you. Back to the slides. Thank you. Let's see if we have any more. Okay. Q and A. Um, so we do have a few questions. So any questions you have, go ahead and put them in the Q&A function and I will answer them. And if I can't, I will get back to you. So our first question here are two questions. As we are brand new to Intermax, well, welcome. Glad to have you on here. We've been implementing, we've been implanting patients for seven years, but just joined the registry. Should we input our previous patients or just start with the new implants going forward? Second, is there a threshold of expected compliance with each data point? Um, should we be expected to perform a right heart cath with every follow-up or is it just an option if, if we did happen to do it? Okay, so first question, it's kind of up to you. Typically when, join, when sites join the registry, they just implant patients moving forward um, once they've joined. However, you won't have any data until you start implanting patients. Um, what we ask is that you don't go back and back enter patients from more than two years ago because the integrity of the data isn't very good um, to have full capture of any AEs, rehospitalizations, et cetera. Um, so if you would like to put some patients in the registry, I would just do most recent, probably within a year, or even a year and a half at the latest, just for the integrity of the data. Um, and there is not a threshold of expected compliance as far as um, labs that need to be drawn or right heart cath or echo at every follow-up. Um, Cause I know every center has their own um, standards and guidelines. So if you happen to have a right heart cath, we do have the data fields for that um, data to be entered, but it is not expected. Um, next question from Lori. Hi, Lori. Um, will Intermax be using the patient transfer email as well? Yes, it is. It is live for um, Intermax as well as PDMax. Um, and that email will go to the site admin with that patient ID. Um, are we able to download all questions that were asked? Um, I, think, I think that's related to the FAQ mailbox. Yeah, I think so too, yeah. No, we don't have a uh, service like that where you could download all the questions with the answers. Um, what usually comes into the FAQ mailbox are very specific to the site and patient. So uh, we review those questions, we get answers if it's um, something that we can discuss without um, involving the physicians and provide an answer, we do that. Otherwise, it'll go to the core group, which is a group of um, data management professionals and our surgeons, uh, cardiologists, colleagues, 
that review the questions and provide guidance on those questions. Because they're so specific, we don't post each individual question because oftentimes we have to go back to sites and get more information regarding that case, maybe off notes or consultations, um, things like that. So the way that we've been um, handling is we take those questions and we try to make them more generalized be before updating the training manual or training documentation with the FAQ document. So you'll see the FAQ document, it might be a little bit more general or might be similar to a question that you submitted, but it's not exactly the same. Um, it's just so that we can make that answer more applicable um, to, so to a larger group of patients or sites. So you won't be able to download all the questions and answers. Um, that would be really probably a little dangerous to do for, for our sake, just because of all the nuances that go into each of those questions and all of the additional information. Um, that's required to provide an accurate answer. So I hope that helps. Thank you, Carol. Yes, ma'am. No, thank you, Patricia. <laughs> what it looks else? like we Your accidentally question. started another webinar, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we have a, no, I don't see any other questions. All right. Um... I think there might be one or two more slides, Carol, and I think okay. the last one is just a reminder. Our next webinar is 1 p.m. Central Time, March 27th, um, and I do just want to add that we are um, in the process of developing a um, new data managers webinar. So in the coming months, I don't know if it'll be March, hopefully April, at the latest would be May, we are going to host a one of, on this webinar, we're going to um, post it and gear it, gear it towards a new data manager um, because we have lots of new people um, entering data for Intermax and PDMax. And so we'd like to just have a recorded webinar where um, we go through all the things beginning to end, entering patients, all the forms, all the resources, um, everything that's available to you. And that will um, be recorded and it will be a really good reference tool, hopefully that you can go back and use um, as um, new people come onto your site or um, if you just wanna reference it back for educational purposes. So that is coming. Um, I don't know if it'll be March, but hopefully April, the latest May, um, that will be the topic of one of our webinars is um, a new data manager. Awesome, thanks Patricia. Next slide. Oh, we went through this. Um, here's my contact information. Again, patricia.potter at curso.net. Um, the STS um, website, how to su um, submit a clinical FAQ question or just um, general contact and support. And yeah, I think that's everything, Carol. I think that's it. Have any more questions? If you think of something after this webinar, feel free to send me an email. Um, if something pops in your head um, anytime. And if you have questions for Devin or Brandon, I can help to um, circulate those emails to them. So thank you everybody for joining. Thanks, Patricia. Thanks everybody for joining. Have a great rest of the day. Um, and we'll see you again on March 27th.